Okay, so this is our uh, seventh and last uh, lesson in believer building. And uh, let me make sure I put the battery in right. I don't think so. Uh huh, ain't that amazing? Uh, boy, this has been an interesting night already. <laughs> I'm excited about tonight's lesson. Um, I sent out that email today. I wanted to encourage people to be here uh, because this is something that we all need, at least as far as I can tell. Because uh, all of us have burdens. Uh, sometimes the burdens are, are fairly light and uh, easy to handle, but sometimes they're devastating. Sometimes there's burdens that uh, we don't know how to bear them. They're so heavy that we, we collapse under their weight. Some are emotional, some physical, some relational, some financial. Uh, we must bear all kinds of burdens. And while uh, I think that there's some people out there, they think that, you know, Christians, that we think that our lives are perfect. Uh, of course, if there's anyone here that thinks that, I'd like to, you to raise your hand and give me a testimony because uh, I haven't found that perfect Christian yet. And certainly I wouldn't claim to be, but we all have burdens and not necessarily uh, able to manage those bear burdens or bear those burdens appropriately. So in Galatians 6, 2, 8, it says, bear you one another burdens. And then, of course, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here, this word bear conveys the idea of giving a helping hand to someone carrying a heavy load. Uh, excuse me. Bearing one another's uh, burdens include four things. So what we're going to, excuse me. What we're going to find through this uh, lesson is that there are burdens that we should help people carry. Uh, but before we get into that, just let me say, remember how many times I've admonished us because there's times when people have needed things in their life but without a pride, they haven't said anything. So they end up being crushed by the burden that they have. And then whenever you know they're at, the, at their wit's end or whatever, then they just explode. So, uh, so just be mindful that uh, there's burdens that we, we can help other people with, but then again, there's burdens that we have to carry alone. And uh, so we just have to learn, you know, the difference. So the first is uh, the, the command to bear one another's burdens follows, uh, follows a verse describing what it means to bear another's burden when they fall into sin. So Galatians 6, when a brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and then it goes on and says, you which are spiritual, restore such a one at the in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So the word overtaken carries the idea of someone running from sin, but the sin is faster, so it overtakes that person. I think that sometimes we, we make mistakes. We don't run fast enough. You know, I think about Joseph and, and Potiphar's wife. You know, he jumped up and run. Uh, there's been times, I think, in, in people's lives that we failed to jump up and run. I remember years ago, uh, we went to a movie, and Nicole was just a teenager, and there were a couple things in that movie, and I thought, man, that ain't, that ain't right. And then I'm walking out, and I thought, you're an idiot. Your daughter's with you. And so I turned to her, and I said, Nicole, I apologize. We should have walked out of that movie. You know, I didn't, I didn't do my thing. And so, uh, but I think sometimes we do things like that. We, um, and, and, and sometimes things that are a little bit more costly, but... Um, sometimes we just don't run fast enough. We fall into sin. Uh, there's a difference between stumbling into sin and embracing sin and living in sin, uh, a big difference. So therefore, this is someone who's trying to live the Christian life, but lets their guard down and is overtaken by sin. Uh, it happens. Listen, I can remember years ago, I used to stand, teach a Sunday school or something, I'd sit here and I'd go, me and God are this close. We are this close. And every time I'd say that, it'd be like the next day, I'd lose my temper, you know, and I'd be like, okay, Lord, got it, you know. I mean, you never get so close to God that you're sin free. Doesn't happen. Uh, not in this life. None of us, no matter how spiritual we may seem, are above being overtaken by some sin. Paul gives us this warning in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. When you... As I was thinking about this, uh, I don't know if you've ever met that Christian that they believe that they are so, they're so pious, they are so close to God, that they will sin as a result of that closeness, thinking that somehow they're getting a, a mulligan. 
that they're free to, to uh, carry themselves, you know, uh, in, in a judgmental, uh, superior attitude and uh, things of that nature. Uh, so if you've never run into a person, God bless you, but they're out there. Therefore, we must never secretly rejoice when a brother or sister is overtaken by some sin. Now listen, there's people that do this. There's people that are jealous over someone that they think is pious, but in fact they might just be more spiritually mature. And so, you know, they, they don't like that person. You know, oh, they think they're so good. Well, unless they told you that, I don't know why you would come to that conclusion. Because the Bible sets the standard for us that be thou holy for he is holy. So we're supposed to be holy. And when we see someone that's living a holy and righteous life, that should encourage us. I don't know about you, but I believe that God wouldn't put a standard out there that we can't meet. And so if I see someone living a holy and righteous life, that's the person I want as my friend. I want to be influenced by people like that. Uh, we all run from some uh, kind of sin every day because we're all targets of the evil one. If you're not running from something, he's already got you. <laughs> and he's not worried about you. Um, listen, when I said the other day about Brother Harold, I remember him teaching when I was a teenager uh, that you can't, uh, your mind cannot occupy two thoughts at once. And so based on that statement, I would, whenever I was you know, losing my temper or thinking things I shouldn't think or whatever, uh, I, would, I would quote a Bible verse, you know, and uh, I would push out the evil thought with Scripture. So Tom, sometimes a brother or sister lets their guard down and is overtaken by a sin, and when this happens, we need to remember what Jesus said here in Luke 6.31, and as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Man, if we would just kind of do just this. Treat others as we would like to be treated. Uh, one of the things that it did not take me long to learn as a manager, uh, you know, when an employee messed up, they wanted forgiveness. But if another employee did something to them, they wanted their heads. Fire them. And you see the same thing in the media today. You know, people can't make a mistake or they want to chop your head off. But if that person makes a mistake, then, you know, somehow they're supposed to be forgiven. Yeah, exactly. And so if we would just process this about how you would want to be handled, uh, because one of the things, like I said, that I believe is weakening the church of today is pride, uh, because we're not standing up and we're not saying, I need help in this area of my life, you know, our finances are bad, or, you know, I'm, I'm lusting after this person at work, or whatever the case may be. That would be a hard one, all right? Um, but these are things that we need prayer with. And you don't have to get detailed in your prayer requests. You can just stand up and just say, hey, you know, I've got things going on in my life that I'm finding challenging, and I need, I need to be encouraged by the Word of God. I need to trust in the Word of God. I need my faith to be built uh, so that I can withstand this assault. Uh, when we, when I heard it said one time, whenever Brother Lionel, he's one of our Cuban pastors, was here years ago, and he gave an illustration about a young man that was preaching like his first uh, sermon, and he was all full of himself, and he he got up in the pulpit and he just he just blew it. He just stumbled over his words, couldn't get his thoughts together. And, and he said when he came down, he went up full of pride and he came down and he was very humbled. And the pastor pulled him aside and said, had you gone into the pulpit as humble as you came out of the pulpit, that would have happened a lot different. And so, uh, so we need to think about how we want to be treated as we're treating others and, and dealing with this. So this means you should ask yourself, you know, how do I want to be treated if I were overtaken by sin in some way? Well, if we're overtaken, in, overtaken by sin, what, what do we need? What do we need from our brothers and sisters in Christ? What do we need? Encouragement, Encouragement forgiveness. What else? Love. Okay, love. What else? Understanding. Understanding. Compassion. Pardon me? Compassion. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yes. And, and the only one that I would add to that is godly counsel. I say that because in, in my work experience, and, and, and I'm sorry, ladies, I'm going to have to pick on some of my sisters here. Um, I would overhear conversations at work, in the lunchroom or whatever, and, you know, this, the one lady would be a Christian lady having marital problems and, 
you know, complaining about her husband to an unbeliever, which is a bad idea to begin with. Um, and the unbelieving lady would say, I wouldn't put up with that. I'd kick him to the curb. Well, that's about as ungodly of a piece of advice as you're supposed to get. And, and, this, and this person, you know, they're friends, and so that person has influence. Well, no one should have more influence upon you, more influence on you than the Holy Spirit. But I've seen it, you know. Uh, so then we want to be treated the same way we want to be treated. We want godly counsel. Um, we don't want judgment. We don't want a, a pious attitude. We don't want a superior attitude. We want compassion. And uh, we want someone that their goal, as in Galatians 6, 1, is restore, meaning to repair or mend, that we want to be restored. Uh, listen, I had a brother come to me not too long ago with a shocking confession. I would have never, never guessed it. And um, so, you know, we, we talked and, and uh, we had prayer together. And, and then I, but then I did tell him, I said, listen, uh, you know, there, it's obvious that you're repentant. Um, let's focus on what you've done right. You've gone to God. You've asked for him to forgive you. You've come and you've told me as the pastor of your, of your, of your sin. And we've prayed together. I'll be praying for you. Um, build on that. Don't linger over here in this guilt because you've done what God told you to do. And he promised us forgiveness if we will humble ourselves. And so, you know, that's the whole thing. We want to restore that person. We don't want to take the opportunity. And I'll, and I'll just say this. We don't want to take the opportunity as an immature believer um, because, listen, whether you are today or not, you have been. Not everybody can claim to be a mature believer. Uh, we're all at different stages. Listen, you know, you can ask Warren and John. We go to lunch and I just shake my head over Missler. And, and these guys have listened to him for years. And I sit in front of my computer at night and I go, you're an idiot. You know, this guy is amazing. And he's opening my eyes up to some stuff. But the fact is, is that, you know, am I, I'm certainly more knowledgeable than I was when I got saved at 13, okay? I've had 50 years to, to do this stuff. We, yeah, we're hoping. All right, well, pray for me. Uh, and, and, but still, I got more to learn. I am, I am uh, d trying to dig as deep as I can in all this end times f uh, prophecy, trying to understand what's going on in the Middle East here, uh, because I do have the, I do have the belief that this is the beginning. Uh, I don't understand necessarily what the exact timeline is supposed to be, but I'm trying. So we want to be restored, and restore here is in present tense, which means continuous action and indicates the need for patience and perseverance in the process. So let me ask you this question. What kind of burden would require our patience? you got a brother or sister, they've got a, a burden. What kind would require patience? Okay, but give, give me an example. Okay. All right. Somebody give me an example. What kind what kind of what kind of sin might they be in? Um, it could be an addiction. It could be anger. Uh, it just, it could just be uh, pride. Vulgar language, yes. The, yeah, that's that one seems to be prevalent amongst our, our people today. Uh, but I don't know what is gained. Now, let's, let, me, let me make a caveat here. There's a difference between losing your temper, temper with someone and being firm with someone. I don't think it, you gain anything by losing your temper and being confrontational and all that. I think you, you should, uh, if, if they're right-minded about Scripture, understand that if you're admonishing them for something, they're doing it out of love, or at least we, we hope that the way you present it, it's taken out of love, uh, that with the whole idea of you want to restore them. But this might be something that's an ongoing thing. We had a new Christian in Melbourne uh, years ago, a young man, and led him to the Lord. The next Sunday, he's back up at the altar. I went up and I prayed with him. He said, what's going on? He says, man, I keep messing up. I just, you know, I keep smoking weed. And I said, okay, listen, you're doing what God told you to do. You're at the altar. You're asking for his help. You're asking for his forgiveness. 
you keep doing this. If I've got to meet you here every Sunday to pray, we will pray. Uh, but we've got, to, we've got to stay after it. Uh, and so what kind of burden would require our perseverance? And somebody tell me the difference between patience and perseverance. Okay. Okay, I like that. Not being overly critical. Yep, no judgment. Constructive advice. Right. To help them overcome and encourage them to see that following scripture is the best way to do it. Okay, perseverance. You have to keep on keeping on, not give up. Yeah, endurance. There are some things that. that are going to weigh heavy, they're going to be emotional, they might be physical, um, that you're just going to have to persevere. You're going to have to take the pain. You're going to have to take the disappointment um, and, and continue to do. Here's the thing. What we don't want to get trapped into is when our brother or sister is failing in some way, we don't want to get trapped into our emotions and uh, have a, an emotional response to this. We need to stay in the spirit. And when I say that, what I'm, what I'm saying is that we want to uh, be uh, directed and guided by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God on how to deal with this situation. Uh, it's never about me. Listen, I have talked to parents uh, in situations where, you know, their kids got in bad trouble. And, and I would tell the parent, do not make this about you. Your disappointment and all that stuff. What, what is important here is they need to understand they've sinned against God and that they need to repent and be restored to God. And if that happens, then they're going to come to you and we'll deal with mommy and daddy later. But we, we want to, don't make it about you. Um, restores also in the active voice, meaning the subject, uh, you which are spiritual performs the action expressed in the verb. So you're doing that. So what uh, we, what does, what does that mean? Well, therefore, we are to be active in restoring the following brother or sister and not just praying and sitting around waiting for God to do the restoration. This action of restoration is not to be taken on by the weak believer or the new in faith, but by those who are spiritual. Um, There's just certain things a new believer shouldn't be asked to do. Uh, The Bible's very clear, you know, about deacons and and preachers and elders and, you know, that you, you you don't bring a novice into those fields. Uh, you, you endanger them with, with the temptation of pride. Um, you know, some people need a little uh, growing up. Evidently, I needed 43 years of it. Um, but uh, it's just true. And so, a uh, matter of fact, when Caleb and... and uh, huh? No, uh, the, the, our youth pastor candidate, his wife. I forget her name now. Anyway... Uh, when they were trying out here, uh, they were new graduates out of Southeastern. As a matter of fact, she may have been a year before. And, uh, but at the time, we had things going on in our youth program with some of our girls that I just didn't think it would be healthy. Listen, because he killed it in the pulpit. The guy was great. Uh, but I just didn't think they had the experience, and I didn't want to put them into that situation. We had one, one girl has been abused by her father and things like that going on. And so I just didn't think it was, you know, uh, and, and I could have been wrong, but that was just really, I was looking out not only just for them, but for us. We didn't want them to mishandle the situation, uh, but I just didn't think that, you know, they had the experience of this. So let me ask you this. How do you know if you are spiritual and mature? Now, that is, that, that is a question when you answer it, humility goes right out the gate, right? So I know it's a, I know it's a hard question, but do you, are you concerned with being spiritually mature? I am. Uh, that's why I read my Bible. Some people don't want to be mature, I guess. They want to, want to be teenagers all their life. But, you know, I read my Bible because I want to be mature as a believer and the only way that I believe that that's possible is I got to know what the book says, you know. And, uh, you know, it just takes, it takes some uh, work at that. So Hebrews 5.14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses 
exercise to discern both good and evil. Strong meat refers to deep Bible truths. The phrase by reason of use means a mature believer is very familiar with the Bible and knows how to apply it to life. Uh, mature believers are those who know how to use the Bible to restore someone who is overtaken by some sin. Uh, the mature believer is someone that spends time in the Bible and not just listen. There's a difference between reading your Bible. There's people that have read the Bible a lot, but they haven't studied it. Um, matter of fact, let me give you a case in point. Um, I was, was talking to a, a local guy the other day, and we were having a conversation in, in his business. And the subject came up. I don't know how we got on the subject, but um, he said that he had gone to a, oh, I don't know, he went to a service somewhere, and he was telling me about this particular preacher in town. And uh, he was saying, I was shocked what he said. And I said, well, what did he say? He said that, you know, that God loves everyone. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that shocked you? <laughs> and he said, well, explain. He said, so I went and I talked to one of the other associate pastors. I said, do you buy that? And the guy, he said the guy was stammering. He said, well, explain to me then how God hated Esau and loved Jacob. And about that time, someone else walked in. We didn't get to finish our conversation. I went, I think you need to go back and look at that. That word hate, it doesn't mean hate the way we understand it. It actually means to love less, uh, to favor less. It's more about God's favoring of Jacob than of Esau. And, uh, of course, Esau, you know, and, uh, listen, Jacob means something like uh, heel grabber or whatever it was. And so he was, he was a deceitful. Uh, that's why God changed his name to Israel, right? And so, uh, so Esau was low of character too because he's willing to give up his birthright just for satisfy his flesh. So we've got people doing that all the time. So the mature believer is to restore them in the spirit of meekness. This means we are not to have a condescending attitude or spirit of superiority. As we try to help up the person and get them back on their feet, spiritually speaking, we must obey this command found in Ephesians 4, 2a says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Listen, it, it can take, I wish it was as simple as kneeling with someone and praying one time and it would all be fixed. But it rarely happens that way. Um, we can fall into sin and, and people that are, um, that are desirous to live a good Christian life and they're trying to be a mature believer, Number one, I think it's a mature believer that will come to their pastor and tell them about whatever sin they've committed and to ask for prayer and ask for guidance. Uh, that, I think, is a mature believer. Um, it's the ones that avoid all that. They, they're, they're worried about being embarrassed and all this other stuff. Uh, that's where we get in trouble. So as we help those who have fallen, we must remember the warning to mature believers, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So... What do you th do? You think he's saying here, tempted in the same sin? In other words, somebody comes to me and they said, "Hey, you know, I'm, I'm I'm addicted to pornography." So if I don't counsel them with meekness, does that mean I'm subject to pornography? That that might be what I should. What should I be worried about? What would be my sin? Okay. Okay, that would be that would be a humble approach. So my sin, if I failed to have a humble approach, would be the opposite, right? Be pride. So that I'm going to stumble over my pride. And I don't know if what is what's the old adage, you know, pride goeth before the fall or whatever. Uh, so we're we're looking at being tempted to to sin against God through our pride. Uh, not necessarily the same thing. Uh, when dealing with a fellow believer overtaken in sin, we should have the attitude of Jesus when he dealt with the woman caught in the very act of, of adultery. Uh, she said, you know, when he asked her, you know, are, where's your accuser? Said, uh, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, obviously, we don't have the power to forgive sin, but we can, we can show people this, this passage we can explain to them that when God forgives, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And uh, to let them know that there is a, a restoration from sin and a, a forgiveness that it will endure all, all eternity. Uh, after her accusers left, Jesus told her that he would not accuse her 
Uh, it should be either. Um, and so if Jesus isn't going to accuse someone, who are we? Who are we to accuse? Uh, we are not to, to judge in the sense of bringing condemnation. Number one, we don't have that power. We aren't to criticize. That's prideful. Uh, and I know it can be hard. Listen, I'd rather talk to y'all's family all day long. Dealing with my family, I get irritated. And, and, and I think everybody feels the same way because it's like you just want to grab them and go, you were raised better than that, right? <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks that? You just want to shake them real good. And, uh, you know, but I could talk to your kid and not get emotional. I can be spiritual. And, you know, with my kid, I'll be spiritual up, right up to the point where I'm like, I'm not feeling what I want to feel, right? So, uh, so number two, uh, take up. The context of bearing one another's burden isn't uh, burdens refers to spiritual burdens such as the burden of guilt and shame because of some sin. However, it goes beyond that. <coughs> As already mentioned, the word bear in Galatians 6 2 carries the idea of lending a helping hand with someone's heavy load. Many of life's burdens are not spiritual but still require a helping hand. Often our burdens are emotional such as stress, fear, anxiety, worry, depression. Sometimes they are physical burdens such as illness, overwork, or overwhelming problems. Therefore, instead of needing us to help up, sometimes people need us to take up some of the burden. Uh, carrying one another's burden applies especially to fellow believers, but it also extends to people who don't uh, like us and who may not be believers. So the first thing that comes, comes to my mind as far as take up is this church is very good when we have someone sick. Uh, take over meals, relieve that burden, relieve that stress of, you know, what are we going to eat tonight or, you know, where's food coming from? And so this church has always been very good at that. Excuse me. Um, someone's sick and they can't mow their grass. Uh, someone's sick and they can't take their uh, spouse to a doctor's appointment or something. You know, there's ways that we can physically engage to help ease the burden, to take away the stress. And again, these are things that I know that you folks are doing all the time. We're taking people to doctor's appointments. We're, again, uh, helping them around the house, cleaning their house. Listen, I will tell you that probably one of my most satisfying uh, experiences in ministry is when I walk into the house of a sick person that's been sick for a while, and they tell me, well, you know, Sister So-and-So just left. You know, she brought me over some lunch and dinner, and, and, you know, and you know what? Sister So-and-So didn't call me to tell me that she was doing it. She just did it, <laughs> you know? And it's like, and it just makes me feel so good that, amen, that's what we should be doing. And so, so there's ways to physically engage that relieves the burdens. And so we want to keep that in mind, and we don't want to be afraid. Because let me, just let me say this to you. There will be some people helping them with their burdens. It'll get messy. It'll get messy. So we need to be understanding that sometimes this can involve more than we think. And, and what comes to my mind is I had a brother tell me one time that he had a guy that came to his church and... Um, he was being, uh, he's something about being forced out of his apartment or he had to move for something, whatever. And he, he, he really needed help to get, to get uh, moved. And so this guy, not, not knowing him very well, he said, well, you know, what do you, when do you need us? We'll come over. And so him and another guy went over on Saturday or whatever. And I guess this house was, or this apartment was packed and it was filthy and it was nasty. And to the point where he's getting, you know, rubber gloves and, and, all this cleaning supplies and having to get in there and dig away at it. Uh, in the laws about justice and mercy, we read in Exodus 23, 5, if thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Basically what it says is, if you've got an enemy but there's a problem, you help him. You have someone that don't like you, someone that's oppressing you, someone that ridicules you, mocks you, whatever the case is. Listen, I think I think especially if you're a deacon or, or a pastor, you learn over time fairly quickly to not take it personal. Just let it go in one ear and out the other because you have to be what you've been called to be, and that's a servant of God. And a servant of God serves all these people. So, uh, and, the, and the truth being is really, if you, will, if you will maintain that posture, even with the difficult cases in your life, you can win them. You can win them. And what is it that Scripture says? You know, uh, Something about uh, feed your enemy or help your enemy. You heap coals of fire on their head. So, yeah, and, and it does. It, trust me, it does. 
uh, yeah. Bearing one another's burdens is the way we fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what is the law? Well, Paul gave this in Galatians chapter 5. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Pretty simple principle. How do you want to be treated? How do you treat yourself? Now, let me throw this in there. If you're the type of person that, you know, you like to have pity parties and you really don't ever resolve anything, you just wallow around in, in your own shame or guilt or whatever, uh, no, we don't want to treat people like that. Uh, we want to treat people biblically. We want to treat people that, you know, where the Bible tells us, confess your, confess your sins one to another. Uh, we want to, uh, people that are uh, familiar with 1 John 1, 9, where if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We want to be that person. Um, and we want to be able to encourage others to be that person. You know, but you might have to hold your hand. You might have to do that. And, and uh, as he says here, carrying each other's burdens is simply love and action and the fulfillment of Christ's command to love our neighbors as ourselves. Check up. This means we check our attitudes to see if we have a condescending spirit or an attitude of superiority as we bear someone else's burdens. Let me ask you this. Uh, have you ever asked God, Lord, why am I doing this? Are my motives, are my motives pure? Am I doing it for the right reason? Um, sometimes, you know, I, I used to, the way I like to put it is, uh, at least for me, the, the problem that I get into is I get so focused on the nuts and bolts of ministry, I forget to minister. And you're so busy worrying about sermon prep and, you know, this being scheduled, that being clean, that, all this other stuff, and then you, you, you kind of get so detached that you're, you're running an organization, but you're not looking at the people. And you don't want to get there. You want to be focused on people because people are the ones that are lost. People are the ones that are hurting. People are the ones that are discouraged. And so we need to be, uh, not allow ourselves to be distracted by all the activity. Uh, God knows we will not be effective in carrying one another's burdens if we have too high of an opinion of ourselves. When we have a superiority complex, we become intolerant of the failures and weaknesses of others. I can tell you this, when I was a young man, uh, even probably 18, 19, uh, I did not believe that I should call any believer and tell them or ask them, where have you been? I said, I'm a, I'm a grown man. No one has to tell me to come to church. You should be a grown man or woman. You know to come to church. And so, you know, that was, I felt that way for a long time. And then after we came back home, uh, I got to where I wouldn't come on Wednesday nights. I just got so fed up with, with the whole process on Wednesday nights. And so I stopped coming. Well, phone rang one day and I answered it. And uh, Granny Marie, I can't remember if she sat in one of these, uh -huh, right here, Lucille Marie. Uh, Granny, we called her Granny. She was on the phone. Young man, where you been? Uh, uh, you need to be in church. Yes, ma'am. I'll see you this week. Yes, ma'am. I wasn't going to argue with her, you know. And uh, I, I got straight because I realized she was right, you know. Uh, and what I didn't like about Wednesday nights back then was they spent all this time singing. Well, I can't sing. Uh, and then he'd spend like five minutes with, with the Bible, and I'd be like, I'm wasting my time, you know, which really I wasn't. I just had a bad attitude. God knows we will not be effective in carrying one another's burdens if we have too high an opinion of ourselves. When we have that, uh, okay, did I just? Uh, we all need a regular attitude checkup. And again, like I said, I ask myself all the time, are you doing it for the right reason? Um, and when we do that, we're being like the egotistical scribes or lawyers whom Jesus so harshly condemns. Even though they were experts or scholars on the Old Testament law, Jesus says, woe to them, which is a denunciation. Why did Jesus denounce them? He said, woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchers of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Don't be a scribe. Never be guilty of acting in such a way as to leave a hurting person more burdened than you found them. Be a lifter, not a loader. Um, Pharisees were, were prideful. They were viewed by the public as being these godly men, these all-knowing men, these, uh, uh, and, and they were revered. But so many of them 
uh, they, their heart wasn't right. They had the they had the int intellectual knowledge, but they didn't have the heart. And so uh, again, I've run into people they know Bible, uh, but they don't know what it means, and they certainly don't live it. So me, listen, I would rather err on the side of caution. There's things that I don't do that, I, that I'd probably be okay to do, but I just won't do it because I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to be safe in this area. Because Paul, not once but twice, in uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians, he asked the question, what, what's the prophet? He said, all things are lawful, right? All things are lawful. All these things you can do by the, by the letter of the law, but what benefit is there to it? You know, why would you want to do that? So, and again, we get into some of these gray areas, uh, whatever you want to, and people can debate that till the cows come home. But in, the way I look at it is, why not err on the side of caution? Now, that's just me. You know, other people want to, they want to walk on the wild side. Well, I don't know about that. So, rather than being judgmental, we should check up or examine our own actions to see if there are any feelings of pride or superiority. Such feelings re reveal a lack of love for our burdened brother or sister. And that's a serious sin in 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not charity, I am, not no I am nothing. That word charity is the same word for love. So if I, if I have all these gifts and, and abilities and talents and knowledge, but I don't have any love, you know, again, we've got people that are extremely talented, uh, they're extremely knowledgeable. But if you don't use it to the benefit of God's kingdom, if you don't use it to uh, grow, listen, why does he give us prophets? Why does he give us apostles and teachers? Why does he give the church those things? So that the church can be uh, enriched, so the, the church can be uh, educated and encouraged, and so the church can mature and become powerful. So what does this verse say about me if I can do all that and not have love? Um, well, it says, I am nothing. I am nothing. And because you haven't contributed anything. When I was in basic training, we, uh, I don't know, there's 40 guys in a platoon. And so you, you're going through all this training, you're having, and not only is it just physical, you know, there's, there's the obstacle course, there's running every day, and there's all these things. And, and so, you know, you try to help your buddies. And, uh, but when it comes to, you know, the studying part, how to read maps, how to uh, uh, build a, a, or disassemble a mind and all this stuff, uh, I can remember having, um, we had a, a Puerto Rican kid, and he was having difficulty, you know, I guess understanding the teaching and stuff. And so we're prepping for our SQT test, your skill qualification test, which would, you know, mean you can graduate and all this stuff. And so we're all in there in the barracks studying one day, and there's this guy, and I'll just have to tell you honestly, he was a nemesis. Uh, I, back then, I couldn't stand him. He was arrogant. He was full of himself. And so we were all studying. I noticed he was over there fiddling around. And I said, hey, uh, why don't you, would you mind giving Rodriguez a... Uh, a hand, he's having hard, hard trouble with map reading. He goes, I know how to read maps. I said, that's my point. No, I'm, I'm writing letters home. Okay. As far as I was concerned, from a, from a platoon perspective, you're nothing. You haven't contributed anything to the team. You're not, you're not, you can't be dependent on, you know, because you're focusing on self. You get that person that's so focused on self that they are no benefit to the team or to the body of Christ in this case, then uh, I understand the nothing here because you're not uh, being uh, you know, a strong link. Attaining all the knowledge and understanding of the Bible as well as having the ability to explain spiritual mysteries means nothing if we don't have that love. I think that probably one of the things that I have learned for sure, uh, because again, I didn't, I didn't come in here until 2006, so that means I was 46 when I pastored my first church and scared to death. I think the brightest thing about me is knowing that I don't know a lot, but I know that I should follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. So, but what I've learned over time is if you love people, you can make mistakes and they'll keep loving you and, and they'll guide you and, and, and walk you through and, and all this. Other stuff. But if you're arrogant and pious and judgmental, 
man, as soon as you mess up, they're going to eat you alive. Uh, so it, it pays to be humble. Um, actually, the more we know, the more of a problem we can have with pride. That's because of uh, what we find in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now, as such things offered unto idols, we know that uh, we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So knowledge can be dangerous. Um, one of the things that I criticize myself with sometimes is I don't look deep enough. Uh, and I've always been that way. Uh, and, and the image that comes to my mind is when I was in basic training, we, we, had to, we were in charge of this mission, and so it was my turn to lead the mission and read the map and all this. And I didn't look at the map a second time or a third time, whatever. And I was on the wrong ridge. And the op four was right above me. So I got gassed real quick. Uh, and of course, in, in that time, I was in running for the number one guy. That hurt in a lot of ways. So I was embarrassed. Uh, but I, I realized, man, you, you didn't take your time. You're always in a hurry. Slow down. Um, so that knowledge can, can make you overlook stuff. I already know how to do that. You know, and, uh, and so you don't, you don't take time to read the directions or whatever, and then you get electrocuted and all that good stuff. So here's, here's the one I was really uh, woke me up, said load up. This means we don't dump on other people the loads we should carry ourselves. There are times we need to load up and bear our own burdens. And in Galatians 6, 5 says, for every man shall bear his own burden." Now, it's not a contradiction of 6.2. It says, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The word translated as burdens, barrows, refers to heavy, crushing loads that are more than one person can carry. The word translated as burden, as fortune, in verse 5, refers to a backpack every soldier carried on his own. It points to a load light enough for one person to carry and should carry on their own. It is the same word Jesus used when he said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's times in a person's life, and, and, and listen, this problem is getting worse in this day and age. People, uh, people are more easily overwhelmed today than in my day, or certainly my parents, and definitely my grandparents' day. Um, you know, young people today especially, they haven't, they haven't had to carry burdens. They haven't had to endure hardships to the point where they know the value of persevering. Now that's a blanket statement and it does not apply in every situation. But generally speaking, I think we're seeing in our college campuses today, you know, in my mind, and I'm just gonna be transparent here, you got a bunch of spoiled brats out there that mommy and daddy are paying their ticket and they're just looking for a way to have their 15 minutes of fame and they're willing to do it at the cost of human lives around the world. Um, so it's just things that we're seeing out there like that and so there's things that we should be toting ourselves. Through the years, I've had people that, you know, they would come to me and they felt like they had a financial burden. But when you begin to talk to them, you realize there's not a financial burden. There's a priority burden. <laughs> You've got money. Quit buying cigarettes. Quit getting tattoos and quit, you know, buying your alcohol and all this other stuff. Those things are expensive. Forget the moral side of it. Let's talk about just the, the economics of what you're doing. You're not eating because you've got two or three cartons of cigarettes in your cart this week. So, and I don't know, those things are getting ridiculously high. Uh, but yeah, you know, they don't have a financial problem. And so what's the first thing they teach you in management about problem solving? Identify the problem, right? That's what we're supposed to do. And, and here's the thing. A lot of people do not understand what their problem is. They, they just like, you know, hey, I'm hungry. You know, I haven't got, um, I had a guy stop me. And I felt guilty afterwards. I don't know, but. I was coming out of Cumberland up here at 50 and 1 one morning, and this guy's got a cigarette, and he's asking me for money. And, uh, you know, I'm hungry. You know, I said, I said, you must not be hungry enough. you got enough money for cigarettes. And so I just kept on walking because, you know, it just, it just hit me wrong. And then I was getting in the truck. <laughs> he says, but I had to bum the cigarette. And so, <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, maybe you blew it. I don't know. Uh, Jesus would never overburden us. Carrying our own burden means we are not to be freeloaders or moochers, always asking people to help us with things we can take care of ourselves. Listen, this can be damning uh, to a person physically as well as spiritually when they refuse uh, to be 
responsible for their spiritual uh, health. Also, as Christians, we need to know we're not to carry the burdens of freeloaders. Paul taught this to the Thessalonians. Look, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. They're not working. They've got their nose in everybody else's business. They're not, you know, they're probably gossiping, and, and of course they're bumming and, and all this other stuff. They're freeloading. Uh, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So really, one of the hardest things to do is when somebody comes to you and they want help is, do they really need help? I used to keep a database back here. Um, we just now get enough of it to really, you know, stay up with it. But I, when I first started, you know, benevolence and, I would keep track. I would get their name and whatever information I could get. And I've had one or two show up here, you know, maybe six, eight months apart with the same story, the same problem. Uh, one young guy, you know, he showed up here one night and, you know, with a boohoo story, and we just happened to be having some kind of dinner, so we loaded him up with some food to go, uh, him and his dog. And, uh, you know, I told him about a place that I saw a sign they're hiring, you know, to work down here on 405 with the trust place. And so, like, the next day, uh, he called me, or I called him. I said, did you go down to the trust place? Oh, I couldn't make it down there. And this went on for, like, two or three days. And finally, I just told him, I said, I think I want you to have a job more than you want you to have a job. <laughs> I said, call me when you get serious, and we'll work on it. I haven't, you know, I haven't heard from him since. So. Really? So, so here, you know, we've got people that they won't carry their own load. Uh, this means we're not, uh, not to help a person who refuses to carry his, his or her own burden. Because Christians are known to be loving, generous, and kind, there are people who will take advantage of us if we let them. Listen, this is playing over a thousand, millions of times uh, in, in the Christian community today by children and grandchildren of, of well-meaning. Listen, we used to have a couple come here. They were probably in their 80s when they passed. Uh, they had a grandson that was into drugs. He stole from them. Uh, he did all kinds of stuff. And he would get, and of course, he ended up in prison. And then he would call grandma crying, I don't have any money for this. And I don't have. So, you know, she would put money in his um, account. And of course, he was just using that to get drugs inside the, you know. And so, again, you know, at one point they were ready to, and I said, yes. Yes, you're not helping him. I mean, you're helping him be a drug addict, you know. Uh, so there's times where we need to learn to say no. And I know that's hard. Listen, Karen and I have had this conversation. We are truly blessed. I mean, I told her, I said, I can't imagine where I would be today if my five-year-old son bucked up to me and said no. Because I, here's what I tell parents. If you don't get it under control at five, you ain't controlling it at 15. And you've lost the battle. But kids today are being educated in the schools Oh, if your mommy and daddy touches you, you dial 911. You know, whoop, whoop. we got people that will take care of that. Well, you know what I think? I think in some cases, good. Take him. He'll see, how long, see how long he likes that. You know, they have this idea that they're going to, a matter of fact, our daughter-in-law told us that, that they have a kid there at Astronaut that she shows up on certain days. She's got her bags with her because she's going to get Baker acted that day so she can go spend three days somewhere as a, like, vacation, you know. Uh, kids have learned how to game the system. So, uh, so there's times when we need to rely on the Lord rather than a person. This is because sometimes God allows us to have a problem no one but him can help us carry. This is the part of this lesson that spoke the loudest to me. We have a good heart. We don't like to see people suffer. Um, we, we, you know, me, I, I just can't stand the idea of someone being scared. But what if that's the time that God has allowed to get that person to the point that they're ready to, you know, they say that, look, look you, you're, most people don't get right till they get to the end of themselves. Once, you're, once you, you finally get to the point where I can't fix this, there's got to be something else, then, there, then there's something to work with. But they never get there if mommy and daddy's there or grandma and grandpa's there, always getting them out of trouble, always bailing them out. Uh, and so there's never any maturity process. Listen, I was, you know, I, I, one thing I loved about my dad, I uh, appreciated this much more when I became a parent. But when my dad, my dad wasn't a talker. I don't ever remember my dad yelling at me. But what I do remember is, if you do this, I'm going to do this. And when I did that, he did it. There was never any 
arguing. There was never any debate. I told you, let's go. And I, I, I respected that because I knew what the boundaries were. Kids today don't know what the boundaries are. And so when they, and, and again, this is just my opinion. So I think it's cruel to not discipline a child because when they get into society, somewhere along the line, they're going to get disciplined. If they keep running wild, uh, either, either uh, an employer is going to discipline them or a cop is going to discipline them, a judge or, or whomever, uh, and that's, it's not fair. They haven't been prepared for this. Um, Oh. They already know. I, I can tell. I, what did you say? I can uh, kids tell me what to do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Listen, you know, we're, we, we're, we're, we are where we are today because of sin. Uh, we had a young lady here one night. We were showing a movie in here, so the, the youth group was in here. And, uh, and, of course, once the first kid goes to the bathroom, now it's a steady stream, you know. And so I noticed that Nuwadis and this girl wasn't coming back in. And I, I was sitting in the back. I glanced out. I could see him standing out here in the hallway. Well, this little girl's just standing there. And Nuwadis is saying, we need to go in. And she, I ain't moving. So I stepped out there. And so what's, what's the problem? Oh, Pastor D, she, she won't move. Now, I just looked there and said, young lady, you've messed with the wrong guy. I said, go get Nick. Take this young lady home. Now, my thought was, oh, Lord, please, move this girl into that van because we do not want to lay hands on her. And so, fortunately, she got in the van, and when they took her home, her daddy was, had the right frame of mind and said, I don't send her over there to cause trouble. I will take care of this. So... You know, but it very easily could have gone the other way. You know, uh, I mean, the next step was to call mom and dad. And if mom and dad won't come, then what do you do? Now you're, now you're on TV because you're having a, a 10-year-old arrested in your church. You know, so it's just, uh, uh, Here, as he says, in this situation, we have a great opportunity to rejuvenate our prayer lives. And so, again... I think that we want to be we want to be cognizant of this fact that that God might be trying to get this person to the end of themselves. I talked to a guy at Southeastern years ago when we were up there interviewing candidates for a uh, youth pastor. This guy had been a very successful guy up in the chain of command with Five Guys uh, Burgers or whatever, and uh, he had you know he had a drug problem, an alcohol problem, and he had just tumbled all the way down. He was literally eating out of a dumpster when this guy who was part of a recovery um, ministry stumbled upon him, got him involved, came to the Lord, and then now he was graduating Bible college to go be a minister. Uh, so, you know, if someone is over there cutting that off and he's never eaten out of that dumpster, you know, how long does he balance between those two worlds before, you know, he goes one way, all the way in and all the way out? The psalmist writes, uh, waited, he waited patiently for the Lord who heard my cry. Uh, it's David, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And then in verse 2, he says, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, or of the miry, uh, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. This is what we're talking about. Are we uh, preventing, are we delaying uh, this, this recovery? by being good Christians. And so we have to remember that being good Christians sometimes, we have to make the hard call. we got to do the hard stand. Uh, you can do it with love. Listen, there wasn't any time that in my life that I'd ever disciplined my kids that I didn't love them. Matter of fact, I used to get angry that I had to do it. Uh, but I could not let it go. I couldn't do it. Uh, my kids made a mistake, and, me, and I would try to say, well, it wasn't that. And I said, man, you can't let them get away with that. They'll turn out to be gangsters. And, you know, so here we go. Uh, and I didn't like it. So bearing one another's burden requires that we help up, take up, check up, and load up. The greatest example of carrying another's burden is when Jesus carried the burden of our sins to Calvary. In Isaiah uh, 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So he's given us, listen, 
bearing someone's burdens can be painful. They can be emotionally painful. They can be taxing. They can be exhausting because you love the person and you don't want to see them hurt. You don't want to see them uh, be unsafe or, or all these things. Uh, but the fact is, is that we have to be judicious in the way that we, uh, we give and, and try to protect. You know, we want to make sure that we're responding appropriately and an appropriate level according to the word of God uh, so that we're not interfering with God's uh, attempt to bring this person to the point of uh, salvation. And so again, like I said, that really jumped out at me because we are a soft touch. Christians are a soft touch. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to balance that. Listen, we had, when I first went down to Melbourne, uh, there was a couple in the church, and I guess they had borrowed money once or twice from the church, and uh, they were needing some money. And uh, so we were, and I was new, and uh, so we were discussing about, you know, if we could, I think it was $300, uh, if we could help them out. And I uh, said, so, well, why don't we try this? So why don't we just give them the money on the condition that they uh, go through a Dave Ramsey class? Dave Ramsey or what's the other guy? Forget the other guy. Uh, but anyway, one of those financial, Christian financial courses. And so, uh, so they agreed. And uh, so they got the money, and about, I don't know, I don't know if it was a year, uh, they came back uh, with a check, uh, paid it back, and because they went to that course, they had gotten their finances straightened out, and they were managing their household. And, and part of their problem was that they had a daddy, you know, who was at the time, you know, he was a deacon in the church, and he was interfering in life. And so he was, I mean, he was doing it out of the goodness of his heart, but he was messing them up. They weren't being held accountable for their own finances, and they were getting in trouble. So, but when they went through that, now, I, you know, the rest of the time I was there, I never heard another word out of them as far as finances went. Not only that, but there was an occasion after 2004 when all the hurricanes come through, and they had some damage at their house. And, uh, you know, the dad was like, oh, we got to get over there and help them, give them some money, do this and do that. Well, I went and talked to them. And to their credit, they were like, no, we don't need money. I said, I do need a couple of guys to help me load this stuff up so I can get it to the dump. They were in, trying to get a insurance on the house, but they had an above-ground pool that had been damaged, and so they needed to get that removed before they could get. And that's all we needed was a couple of bodies. And so sometimes, you know, we don't listen. We want to fix everything with money. Well, here, here's two grand. You know, go do whatever. Uh, when really what they needed was, number one, they needed the help. Number two, they needed the fellowship, the Christian fellowship, you know, to see, uh, see God in action, so to speak. Uh, so we need to, need to kind of weigh those things. Uh, Peter in 318, 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ is glorified through us when we actively are bearing one another's burdens. That's the example he set for us. Um, that we need, to, we need to do the best we can to help others along. Uh, and the Bible even says that, you know, for, for one to know good, to do good and do it not is a sin. And so, you know, if we have the ability, the capability to help someone, we're supposed to do it. Um, you know, it's, uh, again, it's hard sometimes to make the right call. 